Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, it does look like it's nine o'clock, so we'll go ahead um, and get started. Let me just admit these few other people quick. Okay. Um, this morning, we are going to touch upon um, EMIS staff reporting. So we decided we're going to, we will break this session up into three different sessions, so to speak. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about getting started. So the start of the school year, um, what districts need to plan for, um, basically, you know, to roll things over from the end of last school year to get them started with um, the beginning of this school year. And then um, later in the fall, we're going to revisit this topic and we're going to touch upon um, more of the errors. So now districts have started submitting their data. Um, what errors might they encounter? Where to go to fix those? Um, some tips and tricks on, um, you know, tracking down those problems and then correcting them. And then later um, next year, um, before the end of the school year, we'll revisit this topic again and focus on just those things that need to happen um, before the end of the school year and the districts um, submit their final um, you know, uh, collection L for the end of um, their staff and um, course collection um, at that time. So we're going to break it up into those three different parts to not be so overwhelming. Um, so again, um, for those of you that just joined this morning, we're going to talk about just how districts should get started, um, what <laughs> things they need to worry about right now before they um, <laughs> before they submit their first um, collection um, for their initial reporting. So we do have um, a checklist that's out in the documentation. Um, so if you go to the documentation, um, there's a USPS and EMIS connections um, area. And there's um, a, a bullet that's called new fiscal year initial L reporting USPSR EMIS checklist. Now, I will tell you that we are um, going to be revamping this. So um, please look forward in the next, I'm hoping, um, weeks to come, as I'm sure you all were very inundated at the end of the school year with getting through fiscal year end, this kind of snuck up on us. So we are gonna be improving um, this checklist to be more of an all-inclusive checklist. So there's not, there will not be one for just the initial and then a separate one for the final. It will be one checklist for your collection L um, the steps basically will be the same as what we're going to talk about this morning. It's just going to look a little different. So don't be alarmed um, if you come back, you know, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks um, that this checklist looks a little different. OK, we just simply, to be honest, ran out of time to get things um, changed before this morning. OK, um, the other thing that will happen is. Um, there's, we're going to talk this morning about a, kind of a reference sheet, a fact sheet that um, we just started putting together. And I'm just going to bring it over here so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, as we're seeing um, questions come in that are commonly asked, um, maybe just some, you know, important facts that um, have been asked over and over, we're going to put together a document that hopefully will help um, you quickly reference, you know, if we're getting the questions, you're getting the questions. So if we can help um, in any way, just kind of, you know, give you something that you can quickly look at, you know, that says, hey, what determines the fiscal, the EMIS fiscal year and the dates the system is using for the collection, those sorts of things. And this is going to be a work in progress. So, you know, it's going to be updated um, frequently. And, you know, the format, this is a very, you know, it's in the very beginning stages. So um, again, you might see this change as well, but I did want you to know that that um, will be coming as well. And we'll post those out then um, to the documentation in this um, EMIS area. 
Okay. So let's get started on what um, is going to be needed um, when the districts start their um, initial collection. So these are all things that they can be doing, you know, back to school is happening now, EMIS coordinators, um, you know, treasurer's office staff is, you know, wrapped up last fiscal year. Now they're getting ready to start this fiscal year. What do we need to have in place before you actually run that first collection to make sure that, um, you know, you don't get a whole, you know, pages and pages of errors. Um, one thing I want to, before we actually dive into the checklist, I want to point out a couple just kind of general tips and tricks that might be helpful for not just this, you know, what we're going to talk about today, but just looking at information, information. Um, on the, the various screens. So I'm going to go to our um, instance here. And, you know, hopefully all of you know by now that there are actually three different places that um, all need to be in place in order for the EMIS information to get reported correctly. So the first is the um, reportable flag on the employee record. So there's a report to EMIS flag um, on the employee record. And I can open this up and just quickly show you for those that might not be familiar. So it's in this general section and it's report to EMIS. There's also a flag that has to be checked in order for the position to get reported correctly. Now think of classic job screen. Job screen is now broken down into two different parts, the position and the compensation. So they can be a teacher with the district year after year after year, but every year um, they're gonna have a new compensation. So that's where it gets tricky. Um, and that's what we're gonna focus on getting those records um, cleaned up and ready to go for the start of the year. So the position record, as I just mentioned, has its own um, report to EMIS flag. So again, we're in the position. If you go down to the EMIS related information section, here is the report to EMIS flag on the position record. So they're a teacher, they're a bus driver, they're a, a coach, um, you know, a secretary, a principal, and so forth. There's a third flag then on the compensation record. So all three of these make up what gets extracted and pulled into the data collector. So here's the compensation record. Um, if we go down to the state reporting section, there's a uh, flag that says reportable to EMIS on the compensation record too. So all three of those, again, have to be in place in order for that record to get um, extracted correctly. Now, what can be confusing is those all, all three of those flags by default are named the same, okay? What can be helpful is the use of the customizable fields um, in, the, in the software. So if we go to system, custom field definition, what is helpful or can be helpful is the, the um, ability for the position and the compensation, those reportable EMIS flags to be changed. So we can differentiate be between the two. And I don't know if you noticed when I went to um, those screens, my, I've already updated those. So you, can, you might have noticed a difference. And maybe you're thinking, you know, mine, mine don't look like that. Well, what I did was I came to the customized fields area and I actually went to the compensation and I changed the name of this to say compensation reportable to EMIS. Likewise, I did the same thing to the position so that I can differentiate between the two. When I'm looking at the grid, I can see then that it's the position and the compensation. Okay, so once you've edited those two records, change the, the name, display name, then if I go back to the compensation grid, you can see then because I've changed the names of those 
if I add both of those fields, those columns to my grid, I can easily differentiate between the two, position, compensation. And I apologize, I'm not the best if um, at, at keeping track of the chat. So anytime, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask any questions because I'm not always good about. Um, so if we change the display name, um, it will not affect your mass change definitions, okay? It's only the, the display name. So that's, it will not, great question. Okay, again, interrupt me at any time if I just, you know, don't realize you're, you um, have a question, I'm, I'm bad about that. Okay, so those two then, um, again, getting back, you know, change those and so you can differentiate between those two on the grid. Um, and we'll revisit this and, you know, see how easy it is then to um, um, extract reports and um, look at data um, in this manner. Um, unfortunately, the, the employee um, report to EMIS um, flag is not customizable. So you just kind of have to remember in your head that the one that's not changed is pulling from the, the employee record. So this is the employee um, and then the position and compensation. Okay. Likewise, um, there are, there's another way um, in the customizable field area that can be helpful um, in just kind of helping the district out um, as they're getting familiar with the software. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the position record, if I open one of these up, this area here that says EMIS related information, these are now those EMIS override fields. So in classic on job screen, I believe it's on job, um, screen two, um, there was a section that was specific to EMIS. So if the district wants something else reported other than what's on their actual, in this case, job um, compensation record, then you're gonna use um, you would use those EMIS override fields in job screen to report something different. Um, likewise, in redesign, we have those and those are on the position record. So um, you can go in and customize these um, again to say EMIS override to be maybe a little more helpful to the district to know that, hey, if I put something in this contract amount field, that's what's going to be reported to EMIS. Um, likewise, the work days, the full-time equivalency, and then the hours in a day. So these four fields are what's now the new um, EMIS override fields. Okay, so again, you can use those customized field, or use the customized field to go in and change the display name. So make sure you're changing the position so go down to the position and you can see here, we've added EMIS override to those four fields. So just some a little, you know, kind of a, some tips and tricks and things that can be a little more helpful um, to the district as they're getting comfortable and familiar with things in the redesign. Okay. Hey, Lori. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you know how when you're, um when you're adding like a whole new custom field, you kind of say what header it goes underneath. Can yes. you, could we move the four override fields into their own header? Like, and could you show that? Like if we were going to do that? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm using the right word. No, you know, I know it's like exactly the thing what... in blue. I, I thought that mean. would be helpful to have it in its own, just section. bracket it off in its own section. Yeah. 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 Let me, that's a great, um, that's a great question thought. Um, I am going to put together some steps, step-by-step um, -step instructions to do that. It might take me a little time to get it figured out and correct, you know, in our session this morning, but I will gladly put together, I'm making a note, I'll put together some steps 
So basically you just want those four to be in its own group, its own section on the position record, right? Yeah, I think okay. that I think that that would be, I mean, they helpful. would stand out a little bit more. Okay. As well. Okay. Let me put together some steps to do that and I will get those sent out. Okay. Um, it looks like in the chat here, um, we have uh, a comment. Why doesn't SSDT change those descriptions so it will be applicable to everybody? Um, I can make certainly make a note of that. Um, and, you know, I know that there have been, um, that has been, you know, expressed many times. So it's not something that isn't going to happen in the future. It just, you know, hasn't happened quite yet. Um, but I will definitely make a note about it and see what we can do to um, get those changed. You know, it, it would be helpful for those just to default. I totally agree. Um, in the meantime, until that happens, um, you know, it's just something I thought would be helpful to um, everybody so that those can be kind of pointed out and um, easier to um, identify. So I did make note of, of those that suggestion and I appreciate it and we'll um, see what can be done, okay? All right, thank you. Um, so we'll go back then to the checklist <clears throat> and talk about the very first um, thing that needs to happen. Um, so again, I know every ITC sort of handles um, certain parts of this differently than others. So by no means I'm you know, not telling you who um, at the ITC level or the district level um, needs to you know, take ownership of this. It's just these are the steps that will have to, to be to take place in order for the correct information to get um, pulled into the data collector. Okay. So the first thing that needs to happen is under system configuration, there is an EMIS reporting configuration screen. This needs to be changed to the new fiscal year. So once you know the last the final collection for last um, year is already passed. Um, that deadline's you know, in, in our rear view mirror. So the first thing that will need to happen so that the right records get extracted is this date needs to be changed, whether it be at the ITC level or somebody at um, the district. Okay, so that's the first step. And then basically after that, Everything that we talk about going forward, this can happen in any order. There's no specific, um, you know, step that the, these have to take place in. It's just basically um, areas that you'll want to make sure that um, somebody at the district touches before they do their first, um, you know, initial extraction. So what happens is, and we talked about this just a little bit um, before, is you know, districts are going to be creating their new their new contracts. So when those are archived, unlike classic, it doesn't override the existing compensation. It creates a new compensation. Okay, so um, those um, old compensations then will need to be unchecked um, for EMIS reporting. The simplest way to do that is to archive them. So by archiving, by default, those records are not included in the data collector. Okay, so that's the easiest way. If districts want to go in and manually um, uncheck those, you know, report to EMIS compensation flags, um, you know, on the individual records and not archive them, that's fine too. If they want, um, you know, they're, it's really up to the district how, you know, how much they want to see. Some districts don't want to see anything but the current year. Some districts want to see maybe the last couple years or the last several. 
And that's total, it's totally, you know, up to them. So if they're not interested in archiving the records, then, you know, they'll have to do some kind of mass change to unflag those um, or go in individually and uncheck, uncheck them, you know, one by one as they, you know, see fit. Um, before I move on, there is a question that said, can the comma in the formatting for the EMIS year be fixed? Yes, we do have a JIRA issue to fix that. It does look odd, I, I agree. So um, I know that there's a, an issue out there to remove that. So it just says, you know, 2023 and, and not um, have the comma included. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Okay, so we do have um, some mass change um, definitions um, out in our shared um, report repository, um, so the mass change definition um, area. And you know this is where you're going to find those JSON files that we've already created for you to download and then import into um, the instance to use mass change. So it's not something that you're going to have to create um, on your own. Um, we do have the ability to mass change, you know, and archive, use this report definition to archive um, and use mass change. I know some of you, um, you know, either you at the ITC level um, use mass change and do that for your districts. Um, and then others, you know, allow your districts to use mass change. Um, so at any rate, again, not telling you, you know, how things need to be done, but this mass change option is super helpful in mass archiving, you know, groups of records at once. So if you don't already have this um, file downloaded, you can come then to the shared report for in mass def mass change definitions um, page on the wiki, download this um, uh, JSON file. I'm gonna go then to the compensations. And you can see that I've added you know, several columns to my grid so that I, you know, it can be helpful for me to, uh, when I'm using mass change for various things. So I have my position reportable to EMIS, compensation reportable to EMIS. This is the employee. And then I have the compensation start and stop dates. Most generally, these are going to be very helpful for you to, to mass archive records. So you can use probably, you know, based on a start date greater than a certain value or a stop date, you know, um, and, and mass archive groups of people, your teachers, your custodians, you know, those, all those groups that have probably the same start and or stop date. Okay, so I'm just gonna put in a date here um, so we can see what. So here's, you know, I have my collection of people um, I have the mass change um, modular installed. So if I click mass change, if I don't already have that archived um, JSON file downloaded, I would download that. I would come to import definition, find that report definition and save it. That then becomes available as a loaded definition for me to use. So I have my grid filtered. I'm gonna click that archive employee. It's going to then archive, see it populates the, the script below, all of those, um, these records above will be archived. I'm gonna set this to execution mode you can see I have 26 records that will be archived. I'm gonna click mass change. So all of those records that I just, you know, had available on my grid above are going to be archived in just a couple clicks. Now, because of that, a couple clicks can be kind of dangerous. So what I would recommend doing is before 
you mass archive, I'm sorry, mass change and archive those records, run a quick report. Um, encourage your districts if they're doing that, run a quick report. Reports can't hurt anything. It takes a couple minutes to run. That way, if anything ever needs to be put back, um, you have the means and the knowledge of what actually, what records were changed, okay? So that is using um, mass change and archiving. Um, if again, you're not comfortable or you, know, you don't allow your districts to um, use mass change to do that, um, I'm going to be placing a couple um, other JSON files um, out in that same area um, for you to use mass load. So the scripts, you know, the report definition, I'm sorry, is already going to be run or created for you. You'll simply just use that report definition, import it into um, your instance, and that will have all of the fields then, um, the column headings as they need to be um, in order for you to um, run the report. And then obviously when you run the report, you'll have to update that spreadsheet to say true. And then you'll um, import that using mass load. So I think, okay, maybe I don't have one for those. I, I had thought I had a sample already um, for you. But um, as we talk about, you know, things like mass archiving, long-term illnesses, and those sorts of things, um, we will, you have the option for both mass changing them and then mass loading them. And we will have in that same area report definitions already written so that you can easily import those, you know, um, run your report, update your report, and then load it using mass load. So let me point out, you know, if you go to utilities, mass load, once your file is um, updated, so all of those archived records, that column would now all say true. Um, you would save that as a CSV file, browse to find your file, and then we're updating the compensation record. So you're gonna choose that as your importable entity. Okay. In the new checklist that will be coming very soon, you will have the option, or it will display, show you steps for both the mass change and um, the mass update. So if you're not, you know, a district or an ITC that, you know, allows your districts to use mass change, um, you know, you it will show both options. Okay, so that's mass archiving. Um, I did want to, when we're talking about archiving, um, a change that just recently happened is um, mid-year contract changes. So probably not, you know, happening so much at, right now, but once the school year starts um, and maybe like your bus drivers, um, they might run, you know, their contracts might be set up um, on the same route as they ended the school year. And then, you know, at some point in the next, you know, month or so, um, their routes get finalized. So there's mid-year contract changes that happen. Uh, we did recently make a software change um, to mid-year contract changes. So all of those values um, are now carried forward. So before you actually had two records, maybe three records, if you did, you know, multiple mid-year contract changes, you had multiple compensation records. That is no longer the case. Those records now will all become one. I, sh I shouldn't say become one. The values from the beginning of the contract will get carried forward to the mid-year contract. When that new mid-year contract gets archived, I'm sorry, gets art, um, activated, excuse me, the first or initial compensation gets automatically archived. So that's not something you're gonna to have to worry about anymore. Um, by default, those initial compensations will be archived. All of the values from that original, so 
the amount earned, um, the number of pays, the amount paid, um, all of those values now get carried forward. That was not the case before. And it became very um, confusing to districts that, um, you know, on how to report those when it came to EMIS. So now you really should only have one record that you'll have to report um, because that old record is going to be automatically archived. Likewise, then, if you're using the position record to report, you know, something different than what's on the compensation record, just keep in mind that those values, you know, would need to be updated. So if these were used on the initial contract to report something different for EMIS purposes, um, you'll have to go into the position record and then update those fields. Okay. Thank you for automatically archiving those that will save yes. reporting two and three FTE per position. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree, Mary. It's, <laughs> it's a blessing. So yeah. So by default, um, those will be archived. We do have a newsletter that's going to be coming out um, probably, if not today, the beginning of next week. And we did do a little feature article on mid-year contract changes and pointed out some of those things like the archiving of you know, um, the record and so forth. So it makes EMIS reporting easier. So hopefully if, if you still have questions, you know, after today, that article might, might help um, answer any questions as well. Okay. All right. So that's archiving records. Um, the next thing on the list um, is to actually clear out your um, long-term illnesses from last year. So, um, you know, we need to start those over. Um, so if you, your, your district, you know, obviously probably all districts have some sort of value um, in at least a few employees' long-term illness um, fields. Those will need to start over for this year. Um, so to clear those out, we again have a mass change option to do that. Um, again, it's if you don't aren't familiar with, um, you know, where that mass change definition is, you can come back to the same page that we talked about earlier. And there's an option that says to clear out the long term illness. And where am I? Why am I not finding it? Am I overlooking it? Oh my goodness. You know what? I think this one's automatically there. My bad. I had a little brain lapse. I think this one is already um included. So that's not something you have to download. I'm sorry. I was getting myself confused with incrementing years and the other things we're going to talk about. My bad. So um, again, if you go to um, core and then employees and go to that grid, um, I've added the long-term illness column to my um, grid here. So basically, you know, you want to clear out anybody that's greater than zero. Okay, so if I, you know, have a handful, and it's just as easy for me to, you know, edit these records and clear out the long term illness field, I can do that, um, you know, depending on how big the district is, um, and what, um, you know, is, is easiest for um, everybody, you can do that. The long term illness field is down here in the state reporting section. So I would just clear out that 40 and then save the record. But if I have, you know, several, um, I can all, I can use this mass change option again. Again, maybe run a quick report. So I have record of who I'm clearing. <clears throat> I'm gonna go down to the low definition option and I'm gonna click the clear employee long-term illness. 
So again, it, it populates the script automatically for me. And then I'm gonna go to the execution mode. And you can see here it displays how many records um, will be changed. And I'm gonna click submit mass change. And that's gonna clear out then, excuse me, <clears throat> all of those long-term values. Okay, so I have nobody. Okay, so that, that takes care of your long-term illnesses. The next thing that will need to happen is incrementing um, years of experience. So um, again, we have um, a mass change definition for that. Um, if you want to use the mass change option, you can go back to the repository and there's an option down here that says increment experience. So if you, you know, don't already have this um, report, you know, the script um, downloaded, you'll find it here. You would go, once it's downloaded then, I'm not gonna do this on everybody, but you can see then, um, go back to the maintenance mode. I would, once that definition is downloaded, I would click import definition. I would browse to find that long-term illness. I'm sorry, that increment years of experience definition. And then it would be in the um, load definition area for me. I already have this actually, um, you know, downloaded and imported. So you can see here, um, if I click on this, it actually writes the script for me and it's going to add one to the total and the authorized years for everybody that I have on my grid. So here's where, you know, sometimes filtering the grid, um, you know, might be important. Maybe you can use um, a last paid date. Um, and, you know, if you um, want to filter it for just those that are reported to EMIS, I don't know, um, you know, there might be cases where you don't want to drill down quite that far because you want um, everybody um, that's, you know, on staff those years to be tracked. So you can actually, you know, filter the grid, um, in the manner that makes most sense for the district and then use this script then, and you can see it's adding one to the total and the authorized years of experience. So if I would click this, let's just keep an eye on like Brent Hurst, it's nine and six. So I'm going to submit this. Oh, and of course I get an error. And I am not sure I'm not gonna, these test files are a little, can be a little silly sometimes. So let's just do this one. Okay, and you can see it added then um, one to the years of experience. Okay. Again, if you're a district that's not, you know, one that uses mass change or your the ITC, you know, doesn't um, allow your districts to use um, mass change, mass load can be used as well. So again, in that same area, I will put out there um, uh, um, the mass load um, report definition that can be used um, and imported so that you can extract the proper columns and those required to use mass load. And I do think I have a, um, an example here. I'll show you that. So once that <clears throat> report definition is um, imported, then you would go in then and obviously use um, a formula so that you can add one to the total and authorized years of experience. If um, you're using mass load, um, the principal's experience is also included in this load file. So you can load actually your principal's years as well 
um, using mass load. Okay, again, once you have your um, spreadsheet updated, you would save that as a CSV file, and then you would go using mass load under utilities, you would browse to find that CSV file, and then you would use, um, you know, the, again, the employee, because that's where those fields are, um, as the employable, importable entity to update those fields. Okay. If you're using mass change, um, we don't have in that script your principal's years of experience. So that would be something um, that you would need to do um, either using mass load or manually go in and just add one to your principles. Um, so if I, I've added that principal's experience column to my employee grid and I can sort that and see, okay, I have what five um, principles that you know I need to change. Okay. So that's updating then um, the years of experience. And then um, lastly, um, something that will need to be cleaned up is um, if you need to clear out those EMIS override fields that we just talked about. So if you have values in those and you want those cleared out to start over, um, we also have a mass change um, definition for that. <clears throat> um, keep in mind that these fields are optional. I think a lot of districts are under the impression that something has to be entered in those, and that's not the case. Um, so if you, um, you know, you only need to enter something if something is different from what's on their um, compensation record. Okay, so that's not something that you have to um, enter for every single employee. So again, coming back to that same repository, there's a clear um, EMIS uh, fields um, definition that you can um, download. Again, it's as easy as um, going then to the positions grid. That's where those fields are. You would filter then any, um, you know, records that you would like changed. I think I have, yeah, I had those added to my grid here. So let's, I'm just going to do one record so that it's not, doesn't take forever and we don't get all kinds of errors like we did before. So if I go to Frasier and let's do, yeah, these are good. So I have the records that I wish to be changed. I click mass change. Again, I already have this um, definition um, imported. If I didn't, I you know download that report definition, come to import definition, save. It goes you know to the area under load definition. I'm going to click clear EMIS contract fields. That's the the definition's name, and you can see here um, everything that it's going to clear out. Okay, again, probably a good thing to run the report option before we, um, you know, click the submit mass change option. So when I click that, you can see then it cleared out all of those values. Okay, again, there will also be um, a mass load report definition that will be listed um, in the same area for you to um, use to clear out those using mass change as well. Okay, so we're gonna make it easy for you. Those things that I talked about, um, you know, the long-term illnesses, the total years of experience and clearing out those EMIS um, override fields, those will also all have mass load um, report definitions listed right along the mass change definitions for you to to use if you're more comfortable or a, you know an ITC or district that you re would rather go that route. 
Okay. All right. Any questions about anything that we've talked about so far? Okay. So um, a couple other things, you know, now that we have the clearing out um, done, um, you know, a couple other things to keep in mind um, are those districts that um, no longer need to be reported um, to EMIS. So, you know, you'll need to um, make sure that those get unchecked. Um, you know, and again, if you archive them, that automatically, you know, you know, will not report them to EMIS. Um, the other um, thing to keep in mind are those districts that, or I'm sorry, those employees that, you know, have left the district, but they need to be reported once through as no longer employed. So, you know, you're going to keep those EMIS reportable checkboxes marked on all three of those records, um, but you're just going to mark them then as um, no longer employed with a separation date and a separation reason. Okay. All right. Um, as the districts are going, you know, processing um, in these, you know, initial um, setup stages, um, one thing to keep in mind that doesn't automatically um, pull into the data collector are those CJ and CC records. So under core EMIS entry, um, there are actually two tabs, the CJ and the CC. And this is where um, districts are gonna report those contracted service records or a, a contracted record. Um, and these are the only two items or part pieces that do need to be downloaded and then extracted separately um, and then uploaded into the data collector. So, you know, everything else is automatically happening um, with the SOAP service. Um, these two parts need to happen manually. So, you know, once the CJ records are um, entered, then you're gonna click the extract CJ data record or option, I'm sorry, that creates a file. Um, the same thing happens on the CC tab. And then if either of those or both of those apply, those have to be uploaded then into the data collector in order for those that information to be included um, in the collection. Okay. Um, I'm gonna talk about reports a little bit. Um, we do have a report. So once we have everything kind of up and rolling, um, you know, a, a good way to, to check then um, the information that will be extracted um, in the data collector is to use the EMIS reports option. So um, again, there's actually two reports that get generated, the employee report and the positions report. So these two reports here tell us what information is gonna be extracted, okay? on the position side and then the employee side. If there are errors, and I feel like this is not a very good example because this probably isn't real world, you know, real life, there's, um, there might be some errors. So um, that's the part we're gonna pick up on and talk about in the second session, really digging into those errors that we might receive and then where to go to fix those, okay? Also, um, a report that I will also be placing out in um, the repository will be um, a little more um, comprehensive um, report. Um, and I've just called this EMIS list. Um, you can call it whatever you know you want once you download the, the report definition, you can give it your own name. But this kind of gives you a broader um, spectrum, you know, as far as like everything that could be EMIS reportable um, for this person. Um, I'm going to show you, I've already imported this into my report manager. 
So when I go to, to run this, I can actually choose um, where, you know, how I want the report run. So, you know, it might be best to run it for, you know, multiple ways um, to make sure you're not missing somebody or to make sure that the right records are get, getting reported. You know, make sure all your, you know, records from last year are truly not getting reported. So you might have to run this in um, a couple different combinations of ways to get, you know, exactly what you want. But at any rate, um, I ran this report that I just showed you with the employee um, value set to true, the position set to true, and the compensation set to true. So basically, who's going to be reported to EMIS, right? Who's the data collector pulling? And this gives me a, a little bit bigger picture of, you know, all the information that, that is going to be included and how it looks. So I can make sure then that, you know, my, um, you know, separation, recent degree type, position status, position code, all that stuff looks like I want it to before it gets um, collected. Okay, so again, I will be placing that um, out um, in the repository as well um, under the EMIS stuff so that, um, you know, you can use that report or the districts can use that report to help them um, as well. Another thing that um, will be placed out um, in that EMIS section is a listing of field names and location. So oftentimes we get errors and we're not sure, you know, EMIS might speak one language, redesign speaks another language, and we don't know where to go to fix, you know, where that field is located to fix the problem. Um, so this is just a crosswalk saying, um, you know, this was the EMIS, this is the EMIS field name, um, this is the redesigned property, and then where's that at? So that might be helpful as well, um, again, when you're trying to narrow down problems and you're not really sure, you know, where to go um, to update, you know, particular information. Okay, so that will be available um, shortly as well. Um, what else did I want to talk about? I just don't want to miss stuff. Um, I think that pretty much covers the checklist. Again, we will be revamping this. Um, it'll have a different look um, in the next couple of weeks um, to include, you know, the mass change options along with the um, mass load option. Um, so that, it, you know, if, if your district uses um, either or or both, um, you'll have the ability just, you know, right in the checklist to um, see both of those. Um, I did want to point out, and you guys are probably, you know, well aware of the schedule, um, but from ODE's website, if you go to the EMIS manual, and then we're going to go to, um, you know, the um, data collection calendars, they did have posted the schedule for 22-23, um, and it looks like um, if we go down to the um, staff and course collection, whoops, that's the final, sorry, staff and course collection, the initial opens up September 8th. So that's why we thought, you know, let's talk today about getting districts started um, and what needs to happen at the start of the school year before they run that first collection September 8th. And then, like I said, we're going to revisit it and talk about any errors and then revisit it a third time towards the end of the school year to um, talk about just those things that might pertain to the final collection and getting everybody, um, you know, their end of the school year um, re reporting um, finalized. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about anything that we talked about? Okay, I don't think um, I see any questions. Again, I have um, some notes that I will definitely take back 
um, be looking for um, you know, the updated checklist and those um, mass change and um, mass load um, you know, definitions that aren't already there um, for you, you to use and pass on to your districts. Um, I know what the another thing I wanted to point out, we will be doing a session um, on o, at Oetza. So hopefully all of you got the announcement. Um, Oetza is going to be September 28th through the 30th. I think they have those dates right. Yes. Um, so Teresa Williams and um, Sandy Spar um, are actually going to be doing an EMIS staff reporting session. And it's going to focus on sort of like what our next session will, will touch upon the errors, um, you know, from, you know, the ODE side, the data collector side, um, and then where to go um, in redesign to kind of help guide you through correcting those um, reporting options on the, um, you know, EMIS, the collection side. Um, so a little different twist or take on, um, you know, from strictly a redesign perspective. So for those of you that are um, attending OETSA or thinking about attending OETSA, I just wanted to point out that um, those two ladies will be doing a session um, there on EMIS staff reporting as well. And we're opening it up to the larger room um, in hopes that, you know, it will be um, received by both the EMIS the student side and the staff side. So there should be plenty of space for everybody to attend. Okay, does anybody have any questions? One last ask before we wrap things up today. Okay, all right. Well, thank you everybody for your time. I truly appreciate it. Um, everybody have a, a great, wonderful weekend and we'll talk to y'all soon. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you.